Before we look at the inner workings of cryptocurrency and NFTs, let's take a quick look at the origins and some of the limitations of the system that cryptocurrency was designed to replace, namely money. This is Sally. She keeps chickens, so she has lots of eggs. And this is Mike. He's really good at fishing. Sally wants fish. Mike wants eggs, so they agree how many eggs one fish is worth, and they trade. Charlie makes cheese, and Emmanuel makes wine. Charlie wants wine, but Emmanuel doesn't want cheese, he wants eggs. Fortunately, Sally wants cheese, so Charlie does a deal with Sally for some eggs, and he gives the eggs to Emmanuel in exchange for some wine. Sally now wants wine, but Emmanuel wants fish, and Mike wants cheese. Charlie doesn't want anything for now. Things are starting to get complicated. To make matters worse, this is Boris. He thinks he's better than everyone else. He wants wine and cheese, lots of it. The problem is, all he has to offer is his advice and leadership. Yeah, right. Eventually, a solution to the trade problem presented itself. Gold. And other precious rocks like diamonds and rubies. Everyone loved gold. So, everyone was prepared to accept some of it in exchange for their goods. If you had enough of this stuff, you could buy anything. Why gold? Well, it was shiny and pretty to look at. It was also portable, durable, but most importantly, it was rare. As far as these primitive people were concerned, gold was actually pretty useless stuff. They could make jewellery and a few ornaments from it, but that was about all. Nevertheless, because it was so hard to come by, it was a token of value that everyone recognised. And it was a way that people could store value for hard times in the future. Currency was born. As people evolved, so did currency. Gold and other precious metals were shaped into easy-to-carry coins, and trade flourished. But money, as they say, is the root of all evil. Sadly, the world is full of blood-sucking scumbags, happy to take what doesn't belong to them by force. In the 1300s, an Italian family known as the Medici came up with the idea of a bank. The idea caught on quickly. People could store all of their gold in the bank's vault, and when they wanted to spend some, they could withdraw whatever they needed. Every time someone deposited or withdrew some gold, the bank would keep a record of how much they had left to spend. Over time, gold coins were replaced with cheaper metals, and banknotes made of paper. These were made in a factory called a mint. These days, people buy and sell stuff using coins and pieces of paper that have little or no intrinsic value. But what is important is the value that these tokens represent. This is known as fiat currency. In fact, some of us barely use physical money at all these days. Electronic communications and computers allow you to instruct a bank to pay someone instantly, or get paid, without cash ever changing hands. Instead, the bank keeps a record of who paid whom and how much, in a so-called ledger. Once upon a time, the ledger was a book. These days, it's a computerised database. These days, 90% of the money in the world is digital. Retail banks are the guardians of our money, and they provide us with easy ways to spend it, which is usually great. Some banks even pay interest to customers when they deposit money. Not only that, but banks lend money to people. If somebody wants to buy a house or a car, it's unlikely that they can pay for it outright, so they'll go to a bank for a loan. But don't forget, a retail bank is a business with the objective of making money. If a person or a company deposits money into their bank account, the bank is allowed to lend about 90% of it to a different customer. It has to keep about 10% in reserve. The amount it has to keep in reserve is dictated by a central bank. In the United Kingdom, for example, this is the Bank of England, based in London. In the USA, it's the Federal Reserve Bank, which has several branches around the country. A retail bank might keep its reserve in its own vault, or it might have an account with the central bank and store it there. 
By the way, the Bank of England has one of the largest stores of gold in the world. When a retail bank lends money to someone, it goes back into the economy, where it's exchanged for goods and services. Ultimately, that money will find its way into another bank account. 90% of it will then be lent to other people, and fed back into the economy, where it can be exchanged for goods and services. And this money will find its way into another bank. And on it goes. When you put money into the bank, it doesn't sit still. It gets borrowed and spent over and over again. And all the while, the borrowers pay interest on their loans and the bank makes money. Banks also lend money to companies, which allows them to thrive and grow. And this, in turn, creates employment. Everyone benefits. The owner of a company can raise more money to develop and grow by selling shares in the company. Employees, and indeed anyone else, can buy small pieces of the company in exchange for a share of the profits and a share of the risks. People can also buy corporate bonds, which effectively means lending money to a company in exchange for interest payments. Bonds are considered to be a less risky way to invest in a business. Banks can manage the buying and selling of shares and bonds on behalf of everyone involved. A central bank can manipulate the economy of a country for the good of all by stipulating the reserves that every retail bank must hold and the interest they can charge when they lend money to customers. For example, it can stimulate manufacturing and employment by lowering interest rates and making it cheaper to borrow money. This, in turn, encourages people to spend. So, how much money is there? How big is the so-called money supply? Well, there has to be enough money in circulation to allow things to be exchanged. Theoretically, if we keep producing goods and services, then we need to keep creating new money. And so we do. The human race produces something like a hundred gigatons, that's a hundred billion metric tons of material goods every year. By the way, more than 90% of it is made with raw material that is mined, scraped or trawled from the surface of the planet. And, sadly, about 70% of this stuff is quickly burned or thrown away. This is, of course, unsustainable. Arguably, all wealth originates from the earth. If we were to keep printing and minting money indiscriminately, we would soon use everything up. There are, after all, only so many fish in the sea. If production slows too much, the demand for goods and services might far exceed supply, which can drive prices up quickly. As the cost of living rises, workers demand higher wages, then, manufacturers put prices up even higher to cover their increased costs. Workers feel the pinch, demand even more pay, which drives prices even higher. This vicious circle, which, if left unchecked, can continue at an alarming rate, is called inflation. And let's not forget, we live in a global economy. Much of what we consume is produced abroad and much of what we produce is consumed abroad. Manufacturing in one country is almost always dependent on raw materials or components from another. To complicate matters, different countries have their own banks and their own currencies. When a country has high employment, when manufacturing is strong, and when it's exporting more than it's importing in relation to another country, then its currency will have more buying power than another. Foreign exchange dealers take advantage of fluctuations in the values of currencies. When one currency is more valuable than another, it can be used to buy lots of the cheaper currency. Later, if the cheap currency gains value, it can be exchanged back again or for a different currency, ultimately making a profit for the dealer. The price of one country's currency in terms of another is called the exchange rate. For example, if the exchange rate from British pounds to US dollars was 1.34, then one British pound would buy $1.34.
If the dollar got stronger compared with the pound, the exchange rate would fall. If it fell to, say, 1.2, then that $1.34 would now buy one pound and 12 pence. That's a profit of 12 pence. A country may find itself isolated from the rest of the world if its leaders behave badly. If inflation spirals out of control, the value of its currency will collapse. People may panic and try to convert their money into another, more stable currency, or even something more tangible, like gold. Arguably, dealing in foreign exchange for profit, or forex as it's known, is nothing more than a sophisticated form of gambling that often takes advantage of people's suffering. This means we depend on our banks to do the right thing, to invest our money carefully and to hand it over when we want it back. Retail banks, investment banks, shadow banks, credit unions, insurance companies and a myriad of other financial institutions which are all inextricably linked are all counting on our trust. Central banks are the most powerful of all and, although they claim to be independent, they are usually owned by governments. Governments that we rely on to act and cooperate in our best interests. Inevitably, governments, and therefore banks, make mistakes, sometimes big ones. Too often, this is caused by a lack of cooperation, greed, or just pure ignorance. On numerous occasions in the past, the powers that be have betrayed our trust and the whole financial system has come tumbling down.